let us consider the land of Egypt but more importantly the ancient land of Egypt we tend to think of Egypt now as a nation defined by modern borders however historically in the ancient times Egypt was defined by at least two distinct areas culturally and environmentally those areas being lower and upper Egypt in upper Egypt the desert came right up to the bank of the Nile River there was a very thin strip of fertile land during the annual season of the Nile flood this had a very different impact on the people of upper or north or southern Egypt while in lower Egypt the land was defined by marshes and the delta and the f impact of the flood was quite different in this part of Egypt so let's go back in history and to the year 3100 BC the very known the very well famous Nama palette which depicts King Nama the king of Upper Egypt unifying or I would imply reunifying both Upper and Lower Egypt these two distinct environmental and cultural areas if we examine the Nama palette we see quite a few interesting things and this well for instance okay we have the god goddess Hathor connected to cattle and the bull since the earliest earliest time of Egypt cattle have been present as with donkeys as well but uh, importantly on the Nama palette we can see the symbol the hieroglyph of King Nama the catfish and a chisel Nama this is a very important document in several aspects and we should look at this more closely now this will connect to the god Artum, which is typically depicted with a bull's tail hanging from his belt as we can see on King Nama the king of Upper Egypt Artum is a distinctly lower Egypt or northern Egyptian god he's very prominent in that part of the world but when we see depictions of Artum we typically see him wearing the crown of lower and upper Egypt on the Nama palette on one side and the reverse we see him wearing the crown of Upper Egypt and we see him wearing the crown of Lower Egypt the reunification of Egypt then we must consider the famous Abydos Kings list where King Nama or many is considered to be the first king of a unified Upper and Lower Egypt at least however there is quite a bit of important information in regards to that so pre-dynastic kings so for instance we have King Ka and uh, Petri and others well defined so before King Nama we had King Ka however he is not the only pre-dynastic king at least of Upper Egypt and this brings us to the point of what defines Egyptian civilization King Nama or King Ka well before him we had King Scorpio not to be confused with the movie so for instance here we see a bowl depicting the King Scorpion carrying the scorpion mace more importantly and there is another important feature on this because we see the seven petal flower which we also see on the front piece of the Nama palette there is also a six petaled flower connecting in there as well this is rather controversial contentious because there is a tendency to make King Nama or King Meni the first of the kings to fit in with a certain historical chronology however upper and lower Egypt although linked by the Nile River the environments of these two regions are rather distinct as are the cultures of upper and lower Egypt although similar they are quite distinct so in upper Egypt or southern Egypt upper as in up the Nile we have Khemenu or translates to eight, eight town which was later called Hermonopolis while in lower Egypt or northern Egypt we have Iunu the pillars aka Heliopolis 
and this will be an important feature which I'll come to in future episodes regarding the Ben Ben, the flooding cycles and the navel of the world in the Egyptian respects and that is Heliopolis. The Greeks were told about the Nile, ah uh, sorry, about the Atlantis flood but according to the legend transmitted by the Egyptians to the Greeks two pillars containing the knowledge of the antediluvian era, the, the pre-flood era, were preserved on two pillars that would survive the flood. We see this in organizations such as antediluvian buffaloes and masons. More than just the environment, the cultural differences between Upper and Lower Egypt are rather distinct and we see them in these important capitals, spiritual cultural capitals. Heliopolis or Lunu in Lower Egypt and Chemenu, Eight Town or Hermonopolis in Upper Egypt. Now we need to bring to the point of the old gods as opposed to the new gods. And the tendency is to focus on Isis, Osiris and Horus and this particular story connected to them. However, Horus Isis, Osiris and Anubis came to prominence in a later period of Egyptian history. The old gods are different from these new gods. Horus, Isis, Osiris and Anubis are new gods in this historical aspect of this very long history of Egypt. Egypt is defined by several periods. In Upper or southern Egypt, Hemenu, Town, or Hermonopolis, there the primordial gods are defined by the Ogdoad or the eight important gods which are sent their centre of worship being Hemenu or Eight Town, as in the eight gods, which was later renamed Hermonopolis. Hermonopolis as in Hermes Trismegistus, or as in Hermes, or as in Foth. While in Lower or Northern Egypt, Lunu, the pillars, aka Heliopolis was the center of the worship of the nine primordial gods of the Ennead. Their center being Heliopolis, the nine gods of the Ennead, as were the eight gods of the Ogdoad were centered in Upper or Southern Egypt. Completed in 1970, the Aswan High Dam forever ended the age-old cycles of flooding on the Nile River which defined the culture, the history, the entire lifestyle of both Upper and Lower Egypt. What is interesting is that in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, especially spell 125, the parallels between the Ten Commandments in the Bible well, are extraordinary as we've as the Bible, the Book of the Dead and the Egyptian ancient legends have many many interesting parallels but especially in Spell 25 in the Book of the Dead as relating to the Aswan High Dam. I have not built a dam against flowing water. These are one of the ancient rules and these ancient rules have been broken in modern times but you can't stop progress and this is a feature we'll, we'll examine in the future especially in con connection to Heliopolis and how it is now, this most sacred of ancient sites, how it opposed to how it was in the ancient times. In ancient Egypt there were three seasons and these seasons were based on the yearly flooding of the Nile cycle. For instance we had Arket, the inundation or the flood. There we see on the top row we see the symbols of Arket. Especially notice young Horus surrounded by the Urubus. This will be a feature we will examine in the future. But we had Arket, the inundation, the flooding. Following this we had Peret, the growing cycle. And we can see many depictions from the ancient Egyptians themselves including the use of cattle. They did have pack animals. They had cattle and they had donkeys. Uh, this has been a meme which has carried through amongst certain circles that the Egyptians didn't have animals. This is entirely, entirely untrue and actually laughable in a sense that certain researchers would repeat this 
demonstrably false claim, even with a very short search on Egyptian history, this can be completely debunked, yet it persists. But this was the growing cycle. Following the flood where silt and nutrients were brought to the land, there would be perit, the season of growing. Following this, we had the third of the Egyptian seasons, Shemu, or the harvest season, each of these seasons being 120 days. Then we had a five-day period to make up the 365 days per year cycle because it was imperative of them that in Arkat or the inundation or the flooding season that the helical rising of Sirius, the star connected to Isis, the star which was aligned to the Great Pyramid, the star which is so important to cultures all across the world, especially in navigation sense. Sirius remains the brightest star in, how, in our night sky. That was connected to Arkat, the flooding cycle, the inundation cycle. We can also see it in places such as Abu Simbel that astronomical alignments are embedded in these temples. These seasons, Arkat, Peret and Shemu had defined Egyptian life since the very beginning. This all changed, of course, in 1970 with the completion of the Aswan Higher Dam. However, previous to this, we see a very different world. We can see this in the old photos, where the river come right up to the Great Pyramids, where the same Nile River, which defined Egyptian life, also either flooded or came right up to the very boundaries of the sacred and ancient temples. For instance, as we see here, this was the defining lifestyle, the cycle of ancient Egyptian life. There is yet more to come on this, much more, and especially in connection to the flooding, to Heliopolis, the navel and the Benben stone. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hidden under a mountain of trash in the northern suburbs of Cairo is the most important ancient site in Lower Egypt, the birthplace of the gods of the Ennead, the primordial mound of creation, the Benben. It is Lunu, otherwise known as Heliopolis. The centre of the Lower Egyptian world, Heliopolis was a place so sacred the pyramids of Giza and Abu Sir were aligned to this temple of the god of creation, Ra Atum. Though much more than a temple, Heliopolis was a city and a centre for astronomy. During the Old Kingdom, the main priest of Heliopolis was known as the Chief of the Observers. It was also a centre of philosophy as well as a storehouse of royal records, a focal point of Egyptian culture, religion and science. Apart from a single complete obelisk and a fragment of another, little else remains of the once great Lunu, Heliopolis site. Buried beneath mountains of rubbish and threatened with development as Cairo's large and densely packed population continues to expand. In its prime, Heliopolis was a city of obelisks, though only one complete and a portion of another remain on display today. However, across the modern world, the centres of power proudly display the obelisks that once defined ancient Heliopolis. Florence, London and New York each contain an obelisk that originated in Heliopolis, while Rome has several. Though by the times of the Ptolemaic and Roman era, Heliopolis had been all but destroyed and abandoned. Recent excavations on the site have put Heliopolis back in the spotlight, confirming what the ancient documents describe in clear detail. With a recently unearthed colossal statue of the Pharaoh Samtik I, joining the list of Egyptian kings, keen to connect their name to this ancient site, the Temple of Ra Atum, the father of the gods of Yeniad. For it was here at Heliopolis that the creator god Atum rose the primordial Benben mound from the primordial waters before creating Shu and Tefnut, who gave birth to Geb and Nut, the sky and the earth, who in turn birthed Nepsis, Isis, Osiris, Horus and Set. Heliopolis was the birthplace of the gods, and it was here that they would assemble to hold council. Ra Atum was the great grandfather to Isis, 
Osiris and Horus, who are seen as the highest gods of ancient Egypt, though in the mystery schools of Heliopolis it was Atum who stood highest, and the Egyptian royalty invested heavily in linking themselves to Atum by patronising the city temple of Heliopolis. Now it is important that we ask the question, who is Atum and why was he so important in Lower Egypt and especially Heliopolis? And that is the story of the Ennead or the Egyptian creation story centred around Heliopolis. The Egyptian creation story begins with Nun or nothingness. Out of the primordial waters arose the Benben, the mount of creation, and sitting upon this mount was Atum, having created himself. Atum then spat out Shu, air, and Tefnut, moisture, but his children soon became separated from him, they were lost in the nothingness. Ra Atum then sent out his eye to look for them, and here we see the earlier depiction of the eye so often connected to Horus. Once found Atum entwined them together. Atum then rested kissing his daughter Tefnut so by raising the mound Lunu. Lunu being the original name of the city of Heliopolis. Shu and Tefnut then gave birth to Nut the sky and Geb the earth. The sky and the earth being the grandchildren of Atum. Nut and Geb then gave birth to the gods Nephthys, Horus, Isis, Osiris and Set, they being his great-grandchildren. So by showing the important position of Atum being the father of the gods, the creator of the world in essence, having created himself and having risen the mound which is now known as Heliopolis, or as was then not described, Lunu. Personally, I find the parallels between the creation story of Atum and the Ennead as compared to the creation story described in Genesis to be rather interesting, to say the least. A simple change of order would make them essentially the same. That on its own not so important. However, in Jeremiah 43.13, in various versions of the Bible, they specifically describe Heliopolis and the destruction of the obelisks and the temples there. Yet in the King James Version, they tell the same story, but they've simply changed the name to Beth Shemesh. So most Bibles will describe it as Heliopolis, Jeremiah 43.13, while the King James Bible will describe it as Beth Shemesh. What is Beth Shemesh? It is the house of the sun. Beth, house, Shemesh, the sun god, the Mesopotamian sun god, Shemesh, or Utu. Here we see the names have simply been changed, but there are very curious, interesting parallels between many apparently unconnected traditions and cultures. The center of Ra Atum worship since the Old Kingdom, Heliopolis marks the spot where Atum lifted the Ben Ben Mound out of the primordial waters. Recent survey and excavation work has shown that it indeed was once a mound that rose above the Nile flood and that has been occupied since before the Old Kingdom. Heliopolis was so important that entire pyramid fields including the famous pyramids of the Giza Plateau are all aligned to it and that it should be no surprise that kings from Djoser, Ramses III and Samtik I would be so eager to have themselves associated with this temple and city complex. In the northern suburbs of Cairo, buried beneath metres of rubbish, there lies one of the most, if not the most, important site of ancient Egypt, the Temple of Atum and the city of Heliopolis. 
It was the site where Atum rose the Ben Ben Mound out of the primordial waters, giving birth to the gods of the Ennead and so by creating the world. It is also the place where Atum promised Osiris he would bring about the end of the world with a great flood. For the pre-dynastic people of Lower Egypt, the mound upon which Heliopolis sat was the navel of the world. Largely destroyed during the invasion of the Archimenid Empire in the 6th century BC, Heliopolis was then slowly picked apart over the next two and a half thousand years. Its stone and monuments relocated or recycled as late as the 1800s, when pieces were used to build the Alabaster Mosque in Cairo. Its many obelisks and statues broken or moved. The glory of Heliopolis is now almost entirely lost. Only a single complete obelisk remains where once was an unrivalled forest of these mighty monoliths. However, recent excavations have put Heliopolis back in the spotlight when in October 2017 the colossal statue of Sam Tick I was unearthed. Though now largely forgotten or overlooked, there is little tourist value in Heliopolis as essentially nothing remains. However, for the ancient Egyptians, it ranked amongst the most, if not the most sacred of places. Mentioned in the pyramid texts and the Book of the Dead, Heliopolis was so special the pyramids of Giza and Abu Si were aligned to it. The birthplace of the gods and the spiritual centre of Lower Egypt, Lower Egypt being the land of the pyramids, it's no surprise that Heliopolis would be so honoured. Apart from the pyramid texts and the Book of the Dead, the importance of Heliopolis is also recorded in the great Harris Papyrus. Descriptions confirmed by the later Greco-Roman writings such as those by Herodotus and Strabo. An important spiritual centre as well as a centre of philosophy and astronomy, Heliopolis was built on a mound at the base of the Nile Delta that remained above the yearly flooding season of Arquette. The earlier works, such as that carried out by the famed Egyptologist Matthew Flinders Petrie, having been confirmed with more recent finds as well as geophysical surveys, showing that Heliopolis was indeed built on a mound, a mighty temple complex of great walls, columned halls, obelisks and statues that collectively overshadowed even the grandest of ancient Egyptian temple complexes, such as those at Thebes. At least as far back as the Old Kingdom, and pharaohs such as Djoser, Heliopolis was a very special location and temple. Among the finds there were items showing Djoser on what was part of a chapel built around the year 2650 BC. Heliopolis was so special a location that pharaohs throughout Egyptian history have been keen to attach themselves to it in a very significant fashion. The Great Harris Papyrus is an excellent demonstration of this. Originally 42 metres long, the Great Harris Papyrus lists the expeditions carried out by the Pharaoh Ramses III, as well as detailing some battles with the peoples of the sea, who moved through not just Egypt, but also the wider eastern Mediterranean. That other civilizations across the region recorded this tumultuous period of the sea peoples confirms the date of Ramesses III to the period just before the Bronze Age collapse. Also known as the Ancient Dark Age, the Bronze Age collapse was when trade and empires suddenly collapsed across the eastern Mediterranean during the late 12th century BC. Whether by a single cause, such as the people of the sea, or through a series of man-made as well as natural factors is still debated. Yet the written records and physical evidence is very clear and it has now become widely accepted. The Great Harris Papyrus lists the donations made by Ramses III to the great temple complexes of Egypt, such as those at Thebes, Memphis and Heliopolis. The Karnak Temple Complex at Thebes remains the second most visited ancient site in Egypt after the Pyramids of Giza. The Temple of Amun-Ra is surrounded by an impressive enclosure wall surrounding a sacred lake, grand halls of massive columns, statues and obelisks. After Angkor Wat, it is often said that Karnak is the largest religious complex in the ancient world. 
although Angkor Wat doesn't really qualify as ancient, yet this is still not correct as once again the ancient site of Heliopolis has been forgotten. The temple precinct of Amun-Ra at Karnak is the largest and is open to the public. To the north and the south there are two smaller precincts, Wantu to the north and Hut to the south. A fourth precinct to the east of the main one has been lost. Built by the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten, it was dismantled soon after his death and his name was systematically removed from the record, with only a few traces remaining to suggest that he or his wife Nefertiti even existed in the 14th century BC. Said to be the largest temple complex in ancient Egypt, Karnak is in fact the second largest. For if the precincts of Amun-Ra, Montu and Hut were placed inside the enclosure walls of Heliopolis, enough room would remain for yet another large temple precinct. The size of a complex built by Akhenaten in the 14th century BC is unknown, but it would need to be quite large to fill in the available space at Heliopolis. Assuming there were no other temple precincts at Heliopolis, it is still the largest known in ancient Egypt and deserves to be better remembered. Although Angkor Wat shouldn't be considered ancient, at least not on the scale of Karnak or Heliopolis, Angkor Wat is only marginally larger than Heliopolis, making Heliopolis the largest religious temple precinct in the ancient world, though now sadly it remains little more than a footprint under a pile of rubbish metres deep in an otherwise unknown suburb of northern Cairo. Apart from listing the donations made by Ramses III to Heliopolis, the great Harris Papyrus also lists the vast scale of Heliopolis. For more than just a temple, it was also supported by a large city. Ancient temples are often pictured as standing solitary, but whether in ancient Rome, Greece, Mesopotamia or elsewhere, Egyptian temples stood at the heart of a city, not unlike the great cathedrals of medieval Europe who were surrounded and supported by a city of craftsmen, scribes and labourers. The recent work by Dr Sarah Parkak and her team have shown there to be a number of large cities buried beneath the sands of Egypt, these cities surrounding known or newly discovered sites. The Great Harris Papyrus also lists the temple at Heliopolis as employing 12,963 people. A very interesting number given the importance of astronomy at Heliopolis, as well as owning 44,100 acres of fields, 45,500 cattle, 64 orchards, 103 market towns, as well as several large workshops and large boats, making Heliopolis more than a temple but something close to a city-state. These 12,963 temple employees would also have families, making the largest surrounding population at Heliopolis considerably larger. Though more than just its size or age, the importance of Heliopolis is presented in some of the ancient Egyptians' most important writings, the Pyramid Texts and the Book of the Dead. Utterance 219 of the Pyramid Texts details the birth of the gods of the Enead, beginning with Artum, whose main temple was at Heliopolis, the mound upon which Heliopolis was built being considered the very place that the mound of Artum was raised from the primordial waters. The Book of the Dead also references Heliopolis, and in spell 125 no less, which also lists several of the commandments from the Bible, and also much like the Bible there is a special emphasis on honesty with weights and measures. The size, purpose and many references to Heliopolis in the most sacred texts of the ancient Egyptians confirms it to be the centre point of ancient Egyptian life with no real rivals, at least in Lower Egypt. The birthplace of the gods, the centre for the study of geometry and astronomy so important in designing later temples and the pyramids themselves. That all three of the pyramids at Giza are individually oriented to Heliopolis while the corners of Khafre and the Great Pyramid also align are sure evidence of the importance of this site. Along with the pyramids of Abu Sayyid, 
this only confirms that Heliopolis is the centre of Lower Egypt, Lower Egypt being the land of the pyramids and Heliopolis being its heart. The ancient city temple of Heliopolis sits on the eastern bank at the base of the Nile Delta. Not only a spiritual, astronomical and philosophical centre for ancient Egyptian life, it was also of crucial strategic importance due to its location, controlling access from the east to the ancient royal capital of Memphis. It was Heliopolis that formed something of a last line of defence into the heart of Egypt. To control the trade and communication in and out of Egypt, it was necessary to control Heliopolis. Both in ancient and more recent times, Heliopolis has been the scene of crucial battles, the place where empires rose and fell. The battles of Heliopolis in 1800 or 640 AD being examples of the importance of this location, in the 1800 Battle of Heliopolis, the French defeated the Ottomans, so by retaining control over the region. While in 640 AD, the Battle of Heliopolis saw the Byzantine forces defeated by the Arab armies, ending Christian control over the region. Back through time, control of the eastern side of the Nile Delta, from the port of Said down to Heliopolis, have been key in controlling Lower Egypt and the Nile River as far down as the cataracts. Now crisscrossed by roads and fields, the Nile Delta is very different from what it had once been. Where boats had been the only effective means of transportation, it is now the motor vehicle that rules across the Nile Delta. In ancient times, the Nile Delta was an impenetrable barrier for large armies, making the control of Heliopolis and similar centres the linchpins in controlling wider Egypt, the marshes of the delta being a perfect place to hide or launch ambushes against foreign powers. With the completion of a high Aswan dam in 1970, the age-old yearly cycle of Nile flooding was ended. Once the very heartbeat of the ancient land, several generations of Egyptians have now never experienced the true nature of the Nile. Both ancient Lower and Upper Egypt were once defined by this natural cycle, bringing both water and nutrients to the barren desert sands. If not for this natural cycle, there would be no ancient Egyptian civilization. The flood was everything. Indeed, the history of ancient Egypt has been created and defined by this cycle of flooding. It is widely held that the Old Kingdom, and the unified kingdom of Egypt, marked by King Nama, collapsed with the repeated failure of the crucial Nile floods. Rather than just purely socio-political factors, more evidence is mounting to show it was the failure of the flooding cycles of the Nile that was the main reason for the end of the Old Kingdom. Beginning a period of civil war and warlords that would continue for several centuries, where the name of the Egyptian war god Montu was attached to kings such as Montuhotep I, II and III, rather than the Rey associated with earlier kings such as Khafre, Minkare, Shure, Neferikare and Neferefre. Until a new pharaoh and a new era once again saw a unified Egypt ruled over by the yearly flooding cycle of the Nile rather than just a king. The yearly cycle of life-giving floods was essential to both Upper and Lower Egypt, though in Lower Egypt and the Nile Delta it was more pronounced as the waters slowed and broadened into the marshes of the Nile Delta, the Nile Delta being marked by the ancient capital of Memphis, the Giza Pyramids and Heliopolis. Far more than a spiritual, scientific and record-keeping centre of ancient Egypt, the city temple of Heliopolis was also a key to controlling ancient Egypt militarily. At least in the days before the High Aswan Dam ended the eons old cycle of flooding that regulated the life of ancient Egypt itself. 
especially in the Nile Delta where the river spread out before meeting the Mediterranean Sea, the place where Egypt met and traded with the rest of the known world. To control Egypt one needed to control the Nile and to control the Nile one needed to control the Nile Delta and for that Heliopolis was an essential key. The very point upon which the gods of the Ennead were born and the world created according to ancient tradition. The mound upon which Heliopolis sat was the sacred mound of the Bennu and Atum. The very centre of the world for it was here that moisture and air, Shemu and Tefnut, as well as the sky and earth, Nut and Geb came into being before even Osiris and Isis. Older and larger than the entire Karnak temple complex older than the great pyramids themselves which were built so to align with it Heliopolis was both sacred and ancient containing the temple of Ra Atum the creator god whose mound was the Benben Heliopolis was the omphalos or navel of their universe not just mentioned but given special place in the ancient Egyptian writings such as the pyramid texts of Unas and the book of the dead Heliopolis is also written about in detail in later key writings such as the great Harris Papyrus, which lists the immense wealth and prestige connected to this all but forgotten site. The home of the oldest obelisks, Heliopolis is also the centre of ancient Egyptian science and records until the great library of Alexandria surpassed it as the hub of learning in the Ptolemaic period. Though for two and a half thousand years at least, Prior to this, it was Heliopolis to which the great minds came to study and be initiated into the ancient Egyptian mysteries. Plato and Pythagoras themselves having been listed as Heliopolitan initiates. Right up until the Persian invasion of Egypt by Cambyses II in the 6th century BC, Heliopolis was one, if not arguably the most, important temple complex in ancient Egypt. Defeating the pharaoh Samtik III, the emperor Cambyses II went on to defile or destroy several of the most precious sites of ancient Egypt, including killing the Apis bull. Unlike other foreign rulers before and after, Cambyses II was not seduced by Egyptian culture. Of his many desecrations of Egyptian temples, it was the destruction he made upon Heliopolis that may have been the most pronounced toppling or breaking obelisks and mighty statues. Apart from the ancient Egyptians themselves, later writers have described the importance of Heliopolis as well as its location and layout. Of these, the Roman era writer Strabo details several key points about Heliopolis in his work Geography. Describing the location of Heliopolis, the mound upon which it sat, the layout of the temple complex and the role its priests played in not just Egyptian life but also how pivotal they were in educating the Greeks and Romans themselves in matters of astronomy and philosophy. By the time of Strabo, Heliopolis had already been in a long period of decline. The grandeur of the temple complex scarred by the Persian invasion of the 6th century BC or dismantled to be recycled by the Ptolemaic rulers who moved the capital to Alexandria and favoured the great library of Alexandria as a centre of learning and record keeping. Travelling through Egypt at the very end of the first millennium BC, Strabo leaves an excellent account of both what he saw there as well as what the locals, high and low alike, told him. Much of his historical account matching the descriptions of Egyptian priests such as Manipho, who is said to be a priest of Heliopolis or educated by them. These descriptions of Manipho and Strabo have been largely verified by more ancient Egyptian records found and translated in more recent times, while recent excavations and scientific work is complementing much of what these ancient writers have told us about those who were already ancient in their times. This will be explored more in the next episode. Thank you for watching. The ancient temple of Heliopolis was probably the most important, 
certainly the largest known temple precinct of ancient Egypt. However, only a few traces remain as over the last two and a half thousand years Heliopolis has been defiled or picked at for building materials from the Ptolemaic era up to as recently as the 19th century. While the urban expansion of Cairo has continued to cover up the few remaining traces of this once mighty site. During the time of Napoleon's expedition, the surviving enclosure walls were recorded as 12 metres or 39 feet high and even much older Egyptian records describe them as nearly 15.6 metres or 51 feet wide. Dwarfing other famed walls such as at Karnak, the Wall of the Crow at Giza or the enclosure walls around the stepped Pyramid of Djoser. Often quoted as the largest temple complex of ancient Egypt, Karnak is actually smaller than Heliopolis, with all of its precincts fitting inside the walls of Heliopolis and still leaving room. The surviving obelisk and obelisk fragment at Heliopolis being a shadow of a former glory, with some estimates having 48 obelisks at Heliopolis during its peak, once again dwarfing any other known or described site in ancient Egypt. While even the famous pyramids of Giza were built with a mind to align them to Heliopolis, whether intentional or accidental, this alignment was recently confirmed by the work of Stephen Burroughs and his team using the best modern surveying tools and techniques. Though if this alignment was accidental, then so too was the design of the pyramids at Abu Sir. Yet given Heliopolis was a site of supreme significance as far back as the Old Kingdom, up to the Sayyid era, being mentioned in the pyramid texts of Unas from the Old Kingdom, the Book of the Dead and the Great Harris Papyrus, the intentional alignment of the pyramids to Heliopolis is not something that can be too easily dismissed as coincidence. Heliopolis being a core site of Egyptian spirituality and sciences from the beginning of their recorded history, with archaeological and geophysical finds also showing it was use in prior to the Old Kingdom proper was begun. Heliopolis was the very site the Egyptians held to be the point of creation, the sacred mound where the gods of the Ennead and the world itself came into being. It is hard to imagine a site that could be more sacred, something that the ancient Egyptians reflect in their most sacred texts and in their greatest architecture. That the grandest pyramids individually and collectively point towards Heliopolis cannot be more telling of just how vital it was to the ancient Egyptians. If just the obelisks of Heliopolis that were moved to great cities such as Rome, Florence, London and New York were returned, if the grand statues and walls were still in anything near their original condition, if it hadn't been swallowed by the urban sprawl of Cairo and buried beneath over 10 metres or 33 feet of trash, the temple of Ra Atum at Heliopolis would be on every must-see list for Egyptian tourists. Yet sadly it is now not only largely forgotten but under increased threat as without the value of the tourist dollars generated by sites such as the Pyramids and Karnak, and the pressures of Cairo's ever-expanding population giving developers ever more influence, the once great temple of Heliopolis may soon be reduced to a small park surrounding its single surviving complete obelisk. Having examined the history of Heliopolis in more ancient times, let's now look at the records of Heliopolis from the Greco-Roman era when writers such as Herodotus and Strabo visited the area recording what they saw. Though first a brief history of more recent excavations and finds to put the Greco-Roman records into some perspective, since combined with the ancient Egyptian records as far back as the Old Kingdom we find a coherent and complementary body of evidence about Heliopolis. In 2017 Heliopolis made world headlines with the discovery of a colossal statue Initially attributed to Ramses II, it was soon found to belong to one of the Sayyid-era pharaohs, Samtik I, who ruled in the mid to late 7th century BC. The Sayyid-era kings are said to be the last native rulers of Egypt, existing between conquest by the Persians and the Greek or Ptolemaic era. The Ptolemaic era was begun by Alexander the Great, who himself was crowned a pharaoh of Egypt and ending with the legendary Cleopatra. Of the Ptolemaic line herself, she was the last pharaoh of Egypt. 
after which Egypt was officially annexed and absorbed into the Roman Empire. Although Sam Tick came in one of the later periods of Egyptian history, his contributions to Heliopolis show the importance of this temple complex. As far back as the old kingdom pharaoh Djoser, relics and descriptions emphasise the importance of Heliopolis and its temple to the creator god Atum. The recent excavations of Heliopolis have added to older studies of this vital temple complex, confirming the presence of the mound upon which it sat, the size of as well as the area contained within its unrivalled enclosure walls, also the attention given to it by pharaohs across the long expanse and multiple periods of ancient Egyptian history. During his expedition into Egypt, the French Emperor Napoleon showed a keen interest into the ancient past of that land, something that French leaders including former Prime Minister Mitterrand have curiously continued, such as the red carpet reception given for body of a pharaoh brought to Paris for examination, or in the glass pyramid built in front of the Louvre which shares the proportions of the Great Pyramid, yet this is another long story entirely. Though for Napoleon he brought not only an army of soldiers but an also an army of academics to study the enigma of ancient Egypt. As well as other well-known sites, they also detailed the ruins of Heliopolis. The famed Egyptologist Matthew Flinders Petrie travelled across Egypt, taking careful measurements of the grandest monuments, as well as studying pottery and other less spectacular items. His work remained something of a bible in relation to Egyptology, as his surveying skills were meticulous, as was his expertise in Egyptian pottery which also remains highly respected to this day. After negotiating with the Egyptian king, Matthew Flinders Petrie and Ernest McKay gained access to the site of Heliopolis. Publishing their work in 1915, they detailed their many finds as well as describing the enclosure walls. These descriptions having been recently verified with the archaeological and geophysical works headed by Ayman Ashmawi and Dietrich Rau. It was this team who in 2017 uncovered the pieces of the colossal statue of Sam Tick I in Area 200 of the dig. An especially interesting area given the alignments of the Abu Sir pyramids seemed to point exactly at this sanctuary within the larger Heliopolis complex. www.heliopolisproject.org will be linked in the description as well as a published paper by the Ashmawi Rao team on their recent digs and geophysical surveys of the site. Now though, let's look at the records left to us by the Greco-Roman era writers such as Herodotus and Strabo. Strabo in particular, since his geography provides a detailed description of Egypt from the Nile Delta down to sites on the Red Sea where the Romans had large ports and fleets trading huge amounts with India. Along with the writings of Heron and Vitruvius who provide a technological as well as a philosophical window into the ancient mindset passed on to the Greeks and Romans via the Egyptians, Strabo's Geography Book 17 also provides an excellent account of Egypt before the memory of the old priesthoods had entirely vanished soon enough to become Christianized by the late Roman and early Byzantine empires. A downloadable PDF of Geography Book 17 will be in the description. Chapter 27, page 72 of this PDF, is where he begins to describe his visit to Heliopolis. Strabo's account of Egypt begins in the Nile Delta as he travels through several areas of interest. Just before arriving at Heliopolis, he describes the city and temple of Bastet at Bubastis. Herodotus also describes Bubastis as a site of particular grandeur, although it only came into real prominence in the late 10th century BC. Both Herodotus and Strabo describe Bubastis as being on a mound, and as it was in the Nile Delta, and the yearly flooding cycle was still such a defining event, that should be no surprise. Though more than a temple, Bubastis was also a significant city, and the mound upon which it was built appears to be largely man-made. Though just like Heliopolis, the temple at Bubastis has been almost entirely destroyed and the mound levelled for farming. Of special interest to Herodotus, it is also of special interest to myself, for one of the surviving column capitals from that temple 
is now here in Sydney and in the collection of the Nicholson Museum at the University of Sydney. Moving south from Bubastis, Strabo then comes to Heliopolis and there he pays special attention to both the site as well as the importance of the priesthood that once lived there. Strabo begins his description of Heliopolis with the notable mound upon which the temple sat, as well as the lakes that surrounded the temple complex, reservoirs that received the overflow from the nearby canal during the yearly flood cycle of Arquette. With the development of Cairo, the terrain of the region has been radically altered, the mound having disappeared as with the lakes, although the nearby canal may be a surviving relic of the ancient past. As with the massive earthworks of Bubastis, the area around the natural mound of Heliopolis may well have been heavily landscaped, although these types of monumental engineering efforts are not as seductive as the ancient stonework even where they do survive. Strabo then describes the temple of Heliopolis as being entirely deserted. He also details the madness and sacrilege of Cambyses, who destroyed or toppled many of the obelisks of Heliopolis. By Strabo's time, two of the Heliopolis obelisks had already been moved to Rome. More would follow. It should be worth mentioning again that Strabo's account of the fallen obelisks at Heliopolis is also spoken of in the Old Testament of the Bible. Jeremiah 43.13 speaks of the fallen obelisks at Heliopolis. In most versions it is actually named as Heliopolis, while in the King James Version of the Bible it is named as Beth Shemesh, which translates to the house of Shemesh, and Shemesh or Shamash was the Mesopotamian sun god, making Beth Shemesh the house of the sun, as in Greek Heliopolis translates to the city of the sun. Strabo then gives an account of the layout of the temple at Heliopolis. His descriptions of the halls inside the temple is not very complimentary. The hall has nothing pleasing or picturesque, but is rather a display of vain toil. Returning to Strabo's account of Heliopolis from chapter 29 of book 17 in his geography, for it is here where Strabo mentions the Heliopolis priests, and how they not only excelled at astronomy and philosophy, but also how it was they who passed on this knowledge to some of the giants of Greek history after an initiation of 13 years. Based on other writings, Strabo mentions Eudoxus and Plato as being amongst these Greek initiates into the Heliopolis mystery schools. Eudoxus being a Greek astronomer, and although none of his works survive, he is mentioned in later important writings. Strabo also mentions Plato, who was famous for his geometry. When Strabo says the priests of Heliopolis excelled at philosophy, it is necessary to clarify what he meant by philosophy. In current times, a philosopher might conjure up an image of someone in a beret and a neckerchief, discussing the underlying socio-political meaning of some 19th century poem about the arrangement of flowers in a vase from some equally obscure painting from the 17th century. For the people in the era of Strabo up to Shakespeare, the word philosophy had a very different connotation, such as in the line from Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. This line could be rewritten to place it in a more modern context. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your science. For Strabo, the word philosophy was much closer to science than the current day understanding of that word. Though back to Strabo and his account of Heliopolis, whether or not Plato actually visited Egypt, let alone spent 13 years there, might be argued. However, Strabo describes the houses of the priests in Heliopolis. Long deserted by them, he does call them schools of Plato and Eudoxus, which could also be read as schools of geometry and astronomy. Just as Strabo describes the temple at Heliopolis with the name of the Greek sun god Helios rather than the Egyptian temple of Ra-Atum. However, Strabo does name it as a centre of astronomy and as far back as the Old Kingdom, the high priests of Heliopolis were named the chief of the observers. Strabo also describes Heliopolis as a centre of philosophy, meaning a centre of science such as the science of geometry upon which so much else is dependent. 
Herodotus names the Nile Valley and its yearly flooding as the location where geometry came to be known and from where it was passed on to the Greeks. Sesostris made a division of the soil of Egypt among the inhabitants. If the river carried away any portion of a man's lot, the king sent servants to examine and determine by measurement the exact extent of his loss. From this practice, I think, geometry first came to be known in Egypt, whence it passed into Greece. Herodotus. This method of land measurement being the three, four, five triangle used by Egyptian rope stretchers to survey land lost to the river, so by causing the taxes levied on the farmer to be adjusted. The ancient Egyptians knew of the three, four, five triangle the first of the Pythagorean triplets so important to understanding Pythagorean theorem, which is so important to understanding geometry and geometry being a foundation stone to all of the hard sciences. It is well recorded that the ancient Egyptians used knotted ropes to make a 3-4-5 triangle for measuring land, yet it is not generally accepted that they understood the important principle underlying the 3-4-5 triangle. That this geometry can also be found in several of the pyramids, including the grandest two of them all, the Pyramid of Khafre and the Great Pyramid, which is a geometry textbook built in stone, containing more than just Pythagorean theorem, but several other geometric problems that apparently weren't solved or even pondered until the Greek era. At least that is the standard view of history, the foundations of the geometry being an almost entirely Greek invention although they themselves credit the Egyptians as their teachers. Strabo also references the Chaldeans as being the teachers of Greece and Rome, the Chaldeans being Mesopotamian. Ancient tablets unearthed in Iraq have shown knowledge of advanced geometry, lending further credit to the very ancient peoples being the ones who taught the ancient Greeks and Romans. Now I shall read a passage from Strabo for it speaks of the secretive nature of the Egyptian priests who unlike the Greeks and Romans seem to have been very protective of their astronomical and geometric knowledge though this passage also points to another very interesting question the origin of timekeeping. Since these priests excelled in their knowledge of the heavenly bodies albeit secretive and slow to impart it Plato and Eudoxus prevailed upon them in time and by courting their favour to let them learn some of the principles of their doctrines. But the barbarians concealed most things. However, these men did teach them the fractions of the day and the night, which, running over and above the 365 days, fill out the time of the true year. But at that time the true year was unknown amongst the Greeks, as also many other things, until the late astrologers learned them from the men who had translated into Greek the records of the priests. Even to this day they learn their teachings, and likewise those of the Chaldeans. Here we see how the Egyptians and Chaldeans, cultures already ancient to the ancient Greeks and Romans, were the teachers of profound knowledge that still defines us today. More than understanding a true year as being slightly longer than 365 days exactly, the Egyptians also taught the Greeks and Romans about fractions of a day, that being timekeeping. Ancient Egyptian sundials divided the day into 12 hours, and so too the night being 12 hours, thus the 24 hour day we still use presently. Although during the night the Egyptians had a different instrument for measuring that, with some examples still remaining, a relatively simple device using a plumb line and a bar to gauge the steady movement of the constellations across the night sky. Though also the fractions of an hour itself comes into question an hour being divided into minutes and seconds. Most texts would make such timekeeping a relatively recent invention. Some would credit the Greeks and Romans with water clocks and other devices for accurately dividing up an hour. That the ancient Egyptians could accurately make such measurements would be bitterly disputed by most if not all leading Egyptologists. I will not go into that this episode for it requires a detailed case to be made although the connection between the ancient Egyptian royal cubit the pendulum of one second and the Great Pyramid is a lovely series of, of interrelationships I have explored before. But this also blends wonderfully into the location of the Great Pyramid in relation to Heliopolis itself. Heliopolis being a centre for geometry, geometry translating into geo, earth, metri, measure, 
as well as the connections to astronomy and the sciences centred at Heliopolis. In the next episodes, I intend to present new information that will complement existing finds about the Great Pyramid, as well as add weight to my own research since the importance of Heliopolis and its relationship to the Great Pyramid fits perfectly within this. More than just the metrology, geodesy and geometry, it also blends directly into the alignment of the Great Pyramid to Heliopolis, as well as the distance of the Great Pyramid to Heliopolis, where once the High Priest, the Chief of the Observers, measured the heavens and the earth, as well as time, while also studying geometry and other philosophies. For it was here, from Heliopolis, that the Great Pyramid must have been planned, not only pointing to the Ben Ben, the mound of creation upon which Heliopolis sits, more importantly, when one was on that mound and looked towards the Great Pyramid, they looked directly at its northeast corner, seeing the Great Pyramid for what it is, a three-dimensional object, a seemingly imperfect object because of the slight variations on each side, yet this imperfection carries profound wisdom, giving a different meaning in the study of geometry and astronomy depending on your perspective. Though from Heliopolis one saw the corner of a Great Pyramid that encodes astronomy and metrology and timekeeping, sacred knowledge through sacred proportions, sacred measures and sacred geometry. Heliopolis was the centre of the earth and looking from Heliopolis one had the best view of the expression of the earth itself in stone, while also being the exact distance that expresses the great year. From this temple of the sun the knowledge of earth, moon and stars was laid out before you there to be measured and from here to be taught to the rest of the world, from the very centre of the world itself, Heliopolis. <laughs>